So what is an argument? We'll take a look at what an argument is and learn some vocabulary to describe the different parts of an argument. So things like claims and issues, premises, conclusions. So can you think of somebody within the last few days that has tried to convince you that something was true? You know, so maybe there's somebody on a commercial trying to convince you what car to buy or somebody um, in your family is trying to convince you who to vote for for the, for the next election. <clears throat> or maybe there's a teacher who is trying to convince you of a fact about, about history or about science. Um, anybody, really. Can you think of anybody who has recently tried to convince you that something was true? And try to think of specifics. You know, who was this person? What was that belief? Take a second. Think about that. Now, the belief opinion, etc., that they are trying to convince you is true, these are all examples of a claim. So in our class, we have a formal definition of what a claim is, and that is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we have a formal definition of what critical, critical thinking is. So last time we talked, um, we mentioned that, you know, in general, critical thinking is just about thinking carefully. But uh, a more formal definition for our class is that critical thinking is the careful application of reason in the determination of whether or not a claim is true. So if somebody states an idea, a belief, an opinion that, they're, that they are trying to convince you is true or that they, they, just, they just believe is true. And uh, in our class, the idea of critical thinking is about the careful application of reason in the determination of whether a claim is true, using um, logic and rational thinking to determine whether or not what somebody is trying to convince you of is accurate. Now, <clears throat> let's digress for a brief moment to talk about, you know, how human beings come to conclusions. How do they uh, determine for themselves uh, what to believe? Uh, there is a psychologist, or there was a psychologist named Carl Jung, who was famous for many things, but one of the things you may have uh, learned uh, from Carl Jung was a way of looking at human personality. So he created a personality typology, you know, sort of a map to understand that human beings are all different. And one of the things he identifies is that there are people who you know, when they come to a choice, when they come to a decision, use a rational thought, right? So within uh, everybody, there's the ability to think rationally about uh, a choice or a decision. But there are other people who lean more towards an alternative way of making a choice. And he says that within every human being is a feeling function that um, sometimes we will, there are those of us who will come to a choice and not necessarily because we've looked at all the facts and tried to rationally come to a conclusion about the facts, but because, but through feeling our way through the decision. Um, now, there are other classes that can help us, that may help you get uh, in touch with um, uh, the feeling function, how to get in touch with your intuition how to get in touch with gut instinct. And, you know, even after Carl Jung's time, when we take a look at how um, the human body processes information, you know, it makes sense that there are some things that our body will know to be true or that we'll, our body will know about prior to us rationally coming to that conclusion, right? <clears throat> um, you know, there's sensory input coming into our nervous system all the time. And our body has been uh, has evolved to adapt and uh, come to uh, behaviors as a result of the stimuli, even though we may not be consciously aware of what it is that we are that our body is unconsciously noticing around us. Um, so, <clears throat> to that extent, you know, it makes sense that there may be some truth to, or some validity to, or usefulness to uh, following our gut when it comes to making choices. However, there is obviously issues with that, especially if we don't know how to read our feelings. 
And, you know, there's a fine line between following our gut versus, you know, following prejudices or, or uh, following fears, coming to a choice out of, you know, emotion uh, that blinds our ability to think carefully about a choice. So in our class, we're, we won't focus so much on the feeling function and making choices. We'll focus primarily on the thinking function. How can we best or better develop our ability to carefully reason through a belief, right? Carefully reason through a decision. So with that said, from this point forward, going with the rest of the, the course, uh, our focus is on how to think carefully, how to critically think using our sense of reason, uh, whether or not to believe something to be true or false. Now, an argument. The basics of an argument include various claims, right? Various statements people have about how things are in the world. So here is a definition of a claim. Any statement of fact, belief, opinion, etc. So if somebody says, hey, you need to use an umbrella today. Well, they're trying to state something, right? They're stating some sort of opinion about, excuse me, about the world you should become a doctor, right? They're trying to state something about what they believe to be true about your life. You can only be happy if you own a fancy new car or buy a nice pair of shoes. Again, that's a claim. Somebody's making a statement about how they think you can be happy. So there are various different types of claims, right? But all claims are saying something about the world. Issues then are questions that are meant to be answered. And in particular, they are questions regarding the validity of a claim. So if somebody says something like, you need to use an umbrella, the issue then is whether or not that's true. Do you really need an umbrella today? Right? So the issue is the question of the validity of a claim. In more layman's terms, the issue is, you know, whether or not the claim is true. So if somebody says, you should become a doctor, the issue is whether or not you should, right? Should you become a doctor? Somebody says, you can only be happy if you own a fancy new car or buy a nice pair of shoes. Well, the issue is whether or not that claim is true. Will you really be happy only if you own a fancy new car or buy a nice pair of shoes? <clears throat> so let's go ahead and practice a little bit. I'll give you a series of sentences and then Think about whether or not these sentences are claims, and if they are claims, you know, what are, what's the issue here? So if I said something like, Brad Pitt is uglier than Gollum from Lord of the Rings, is that a claim? If I said, do you like strawberries? Is that a claim? If I said, Shaquille O'Neal is taller than Kobe Bryant, is that a claim? If I said, Sam should be excused from missing class, is that a claim? If I said, you'll make lots of money if you buy that nail salon down the street, am I making a claim? Uh, so before we move on, let's go ahead and take a look at these. Brad Pitt is uglier than Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Okay, somebody is making a statement about the world, right? So it is a claim. So what would the issue be? Well, the issue be whether or not that claim is true. Is Brad Pitt uglier than Gollum? Uh, if I asked, do you like strawberries? I'm not saying anything about the world, right? I'm just asking a question. So it's not a claim. <clears throat> if I said Shaquille O'Neal is taller than Kobe Bryant, I am making a claim, some sort of factual statement about the world. So then the issue would be, is Shaquille O'Neal taller? If I said Sam should be excused for missing class, um, that is a claim saying Sam should be excused for missing class. The issue is should he, or if Sam's a female, should, should she? Will uh, You will make lots of money if you buy that nail salon down the street. Okay, so I'm making a claim to somebody about what they should do or what would happen if they bought the nail salon, right? So I'm making a claim. The issue then would be, will you make a lot of money if you buy that nail salon? Okay. So then this all leads us to uh, the idea of an argument, right? So basically in our class, <clears throat> our class is, you know, if you want to boil it down to the technical stuff, it's really about arguments, about how to analyze them, 
how to determine what what they are, how they work. You know, if somebody's talking to us, you know, what is the argument they're making? Uh, when we make decisions and choices for our lives, you know, what what's the argument we are using to uh, to support whatever choice we're thinking of doing? Right? It's useful to think of what the argument is, so we can clearly see what it is we're trying to, so we can clearly see why it is we are making the choices that we are making. So, what is an argument? Well. When people often talk about what an argument is, or when they talk about arguments, they often think about conflict and, uh, and yelling and um, uh, opposition. That's not how we take a look at arguments in our class, right? Formally, that is not an argument. Formally, an argument is a set of claims providing reasons for believing that a claim is true. So somebody makes a claim. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal is taller than Kobe Bryant. Okay, well, what's the proof? You can say something like, I measured Shaquille O'Neal's height. I know Kobe Bryant's height, right? So from my measurements, it seems obvious that Shaquille is taller than Kobe. Well, then I just gave you an argument. I gave you reasons to, reasons, you know, different claims to support my main claim that one person is taller than the other. So hopefully you can see then that all arguments will have two components to them. They'll have reasons to believe a claim is true. So that's those are premises. Anytime you are given reasons to believe something is true, those are the premises to believe a conclusion. The conclusion is the main claim somebody is trying to convince another person of believing in. Another way of thinking about conclusion is the conclusion is the answer to the issue, right? So arguments made up of claims. One claim is the main claim that somebody is wanting us to believe or that we want somebody else to believe. And there's at least one other claim that's used to support the main claim. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Sam's grandmother died and he has to attend the funeral. So Sam should be excused for missing class. Okay, well ask yourself, you know, what's the main point here? What is it, what's the claim that's being supported by the other claims? And it seems to be the case that the main point that's being expressed is that Sam should be excused for missing class, right? That's the conclusion, right? The issue here is whether Sam should or should not be excused. And the answer is, according to this argument, Sam should be excused. Now, we see in the first sentence the reasons given why we should believe Sam should be excused. Sam's grandmother died, and he has to attend the funeral. That's the reason given. That's the claim that's given to show and support the conclusion that Sam should be excused for missing class. Okay. So again, the issue is just the question of whether or not the main claim is true. In this case, the main claim being Sam should be excused for missing class. So the question is, should Sam be excused? Okay, let's try another one. It is raining in Santa Cruz right now, so you should use an umbrella today. Okay, so again, we take a look. There's a couple of claims here. There's a claim that uh, it's raining in Santa Cruz right now. And there's a claim that you should use an umbrella today. We'll take a look. Two different claims. Which is the main claim? Which is the claim that's being supported by the other claim? Well, it looks like what they're trying to tell us is that you should use an umbrella today. That's what they're trying to prove to us. You should use an umbrella today. And what they're using to convince us that we should use an umbrella today is the claim that it's raining in Santa Cruz right now. So we say then that the premise is that it's raining in Santa Cruz right now. And with that, we should then believe the conclusion. You should use an umbrella today. Well, what's the issue? Well, the issue again is the question of whether or not that main point, that conclusion is true. Should you use an umbrella today? Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. Um, let's see, we just did that one, didn't we? Okay, so what I'd like to do is take a look at exercise 1-6 in your textbook. Um, 
And then take a look at uh, questions one, two, three, six, and eight. Okay, pause the video, which is preferred <laughs> while you do this. Answer exercise 1-6, numbers one, two, three, six, eight, and then come back, restart it, and go through the answers with me to see how well you did. Okay. All right, hopefully you had a chance to look through those uh, exercises. <clears throat> now the uh, passages I'll post on here so you can see them, we'll walk through them, and the question is, is there an argument here, right? Remember, an argument has to have two parts to it. There has to be a main point, right? The conclusion and there has to be some reason given to believe that main point to believe that conclusion so there has to be a premise to help us believe the conclusion if there is an argument um, i ask you to then identify what the conclusion is of the argument okay so number one the directory of intentional communities lists more than 200 groups across the country organized around a variety of purposes including environmentally aware living. Is there a main point that's supported by another? Is there a main claim that's supported by another claim? The Directory of Intentional Communities lists more than 200 groups across the country organized around a variety of purposes, including environmentally aware living. There doesn't seem to be a claim supporting another claim, right? So there is no argument here. Number two, Carl would like to help out, but he won't be in town. We'll have to find someone else who owns a truck. Okay, so we see that Carl would like to help out, but he won't be around. Okay, that's, that's a claim. And then we see another claim. Well, we'll have to find someone else who owns a truck. Hopefully it's obvious that that second sentence is kind of the main point. That somebody's trying to tell us, hey, we should find somebody else who, we'll have to find somebody else who owns a truck. Well, why? What's the reason given? The reason given is that Carl would like to help, but he's not in town, right? So the first sentence is the premise to support the second sentence, which is the conclusion. Hopefully that makes sense. Number three. In 1976, Washington, D.C. passed an ordinance prohibiting private ownership of firearms. Since then, Washington's murder rate has shot up 121%. Bans on firearms are clearly counterproductive. So there's a few claims in here, right? There's this claim about uh, an ordinance that was passed prohibiting private ownership of firearms. Okay, it's so an ordinance where you can't privately own firearms. There's a claim that says Washington's murder rate has shot up 121% since then. And then there's another claim that says bans on firearms are clearly counterproductive. Now, is there, is there a relationship here between these claims? Is there a main claim that's being supported by the others. In this case, there is. Hopefully you notice that the main point that they're, this person is trying to convince us to believe in is that bans on firearms are clearly counterproductive, right? Well, why should we believe that? What's the reason? What are the premises? First is that there was an ordinance passed prohibiting private ownership of firearms. And second claim is that since then, the murder rate has shot up 121%. Therefore, right, that those are the reasons, therefore, to believe that bans on firearms are clearly counterproductive. So it's obvious, hopefully, that there is an argument with the conclusion being that last sentence. And just to refresh our memory, what's the issue then? Well, the issue is whether or not that conclusion is true. The issue is the question that this person is answering. The question being, hey, uh, is our bans on firearms counterproductive? The answer this person gives is yes, bans on firearms are clearly counterproductive. This may not be the best argument. <laughs> In fact, arguments don't need to necessarily be good, valid, strong in order to be an argument, right? We can have lots of poorly made arguments, but this 
is an argument. Number six, like short-term memory, long-term memory retains information that is encoded in terms of sense modality and in terms of linking with information that was learned earlier. That is meaning. Okay. There are claims here, right? There's a claim that like short-term memory, long-term memory retains information that is encoded in terms of sense modality and in terms of links with information that was learned earlier. But is there a point that's being supported by another claim? In this case, somebody is just explaining to us something. Somebody is just explaining to us what short-term memory is like, right? So it's not really an argument here. Now, this is a really critical distinction. You know, when we talk, uh, we may give reasons to believe something and it not mean somebody's providing to us an argument. Somebody could just be explaining how something works. Somebody could just be explaining how something is. It could be explaining a phenomenon, right? If I said to you, um, uh, there is uh, a strange odor in the kitchen uh, because um, Sally took off her shoes. Well, I'm really not giving an argument to believe anything, right? I'm not trying to convince you there's an odor here. You can smell the odor. Uh, so it's not an argument. I'm just explaining where the odor comes from. So that would be just giving an explanation. So in, you know, in cases of explanations, we're, we, we don't necessarily need to <clears throat> identify premises and conclusions, and uh, we won't have to do our analysis that we'll be learning in class to determine whether or not something is true. Because oftentimes an explanation is just somebody trying to give us the facts of how something works or uh, the reasons why something is the way we are experiencing it. Uh, an argument is some sort of claim that's not, you know, firsthand verifiable, and then they provide to us reasons for believing that claim, okay? So here what we see is more of an explanation. It's try, somebody trying to explain to us how short-term memory is. It's not really an argument. Uh, number eight, it may be true that people, not guns, kill people. But people with guns kill more people than people without guns. As long as the number of lethal weapons in the hands of the American people continues to grow, so will the murder rate. Okay, so there's a few claims in here. It may be true that people, not guns, kill people. Okay, that's a claim. People with guns kill more people than people without guns. That's a claim. As long as the number of lethal weapons in the hands of American people continues to grow, so will the murder rate. That's a claim. So is there a relationship with these claims? Is there a main claim that's being supported by other claims? In this case, sure there is, right? Um, this last sentence, as long as the number of lethal weapons in the hands of the American people continue to grow, you can't see my point. I was using my laser pointer to point at the screen, which you can't see. As long as the number of lethal weapons in the hands of the American people continues to grow, so will the murder rate. Okay, well, that's that's a claim that's this person's trying to convince us is true. And how they convince us? Well, the first two sentences are ways in which they are trying to convince us that is true. Um, uh, uh, people with guns kill more people than people without guns. Okay, that's primarily the, the premise for believing the person's conclusion. Now, again, it, it may not be the best argument in the world. <laughs> There's no facts presented, um, but it's still an argument because there is some claim given to believe another claim. Okay. Now, why is it important to determine if there is an argument? Well, one, if we can see that there is an argument, then we can better evaluate the reason why somebody is believing something, right? This, this is especially true when we're trying to figure stuff out for ourselves. You, know, right? you read the paper or you see some talking head on TV. Can you identify if what they're saying is an actual argument? Because if you can, then 
maybe you give yourself a better shot at figuring out if you want to believe what they're saying. This helps us then avoid persuasion through rhetoric. Again, if we think about uh, talking heads on TV, political pundits, uh, oftentimes they're not trying to convince us, or even politicians, oftentimes they're not trying to convince us something is true using logic and reason per se. Oftentimes they use rhetoric. They try to appeal to our emotions and our psychology um, to make us feel a certain way in order to believe their claim, as opposed to giving us actual reasons, right? Factual claims to support what it is they're trying to convince us is true. Thirdly, it's really important to determine if there's an argument, because when somebody is talking to us, if we can identify that what they're saying is an argument, we can better understand them and where they are coming from. <laughs> this, not necessarily, is about uh, finding out truths and facts, but more about you know, empathizing with somebody, trying to get a sense of who they are and how they think. Um, that is a useful way of deepening our connections to one another. So if you had difficulty with these practices, these exercises, just remember an argument has two parts. So if, if, if you see one sense, not an argument, or I should say differently, if you see just a one claim, not an argument, right? There has to at least be two. You see, at least be two claims: one main claim and then a claim that supports it, right? There has to be some conclusion, some answer to the issue at hand, and there has to be some reason, some claim to support that conclusion. So, premise, conclusion. So, here is a way to think about approaching, determining if an argument exists. Is there a main point to it? Is there a main point to what this person is saying? Is there a main point to what you're reading? Okay, so if there's a main point, maybe you have a conclusion here. Now, are there reasons that are given to understand or to believe this main point? If there are reasons given to believe the main point, then you have a premise and then you have an argument. If you don't see any reason given to believe the main point, not an argument. Now, you know, the way we often talk to each other and the way we write, uh, people don't explicitly lay out arguments very clearly, right? Just think about any discussion you've had with a friend lately about what to do, where to go eat, uh, who to uh, hang out with, uh, uh, what you should buy with, your, with the money you earn from your paycheck, right? Think about any discussion you've had with friends You'll never, you'll hardly ever hear somebody say, okay, here's my conclusion about what we should do, and here are my premises for believing it, <laughs> right? So we talk, you know, very organically and fluidly. So oftentimes there's more than just one way of understanding what somebody's saying. In other words, there may not just be one obvious argument being presented to you. There could be a combination of various arguments being presented to you that kind of all meld together. So just something to keep in mind, right? Human beings are uh, uh, complicated a lot, and uh, the idea here isn't to make us all computers and present arguments to one another in conversation, but to have a better ear to understand somebody when we're talking to each other. Now, if those hints don't help, here are words you can use as a guideline to kind of see if a conclusion is there or if a premise is there. So these should not be foreign to you because I bet when you write your papers, you use these words, right? When you're trying to make a point, your conclusion to something, you might write or say, you know, then it follows that, and then you have your conclusion. Or this shows that blank, blank, blank is true. If somebody says the word thus, followed by a statement, that's usually the conclusion, right? Thus, Tom should wear higher heels. Hence, Sally should buy a new sports coat, right? So consequently, you should spend less money the day after you get your paycheck. Accordingly, this is true. So this must be true. My conclusion is, which is a very obvious set of words, right? Or which I see a lot in papers is therefore, therefore, this must be true. So all of these sorts of terms 
are kind of hints that somebody is telling you what their conclusion is, right? What the main point is. And then there are also some words that are often associated with premises, you know, reasons to believe these things. You know, since um, Joe makes only $5 an hour, it follows that he doesn't have a good job, right? So since gives us the premise. For gives us a premise because blank, 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 blank is true. Therefore, you should believe something else, right? So because leads us usually to a premise. In view of the fact that um, pizzas are um, in high demand, you should um, open up a pizza shop, right? So in view of pizzas are in high demand, meaning that's the premise, conclusion, you should open up a pizza shop. Uh, this is implied by, that usually leads to a premise, Given that something is true, you should believe this. So given often leads to a premise. Okay, these are just kind of linguistic tricks, knowing how human beings in the English world often speak that you can use to identify what a conclusion is or what the premises are. Hopefully, as you go through all the exercises throughout our term, it'll become more second nature to you, right? to uh, see and identify different parts of the argument. Okay, so uh, in our next lecture, we'll talk about uh, different types of claims because sometimes there are claims that don't really need to be answered, right? Uh, in other words, there's some types of claims that there's really no, uh, may not necessarily be a right or wrong uh, answer to whether or not they're true. And we'll take a look more at how to identify an issue, okay?